There's a lot to say, and there is a lot to be done organizing educational events, especially if you are totally new to a country. So first, I always have to identify the people on the ground who are at least a little bit aligned with uh, the message I have, like doing Bitcoin-only education. And these people also have have to have the time to support the work. And most importantly, I need to find out if I can trust people before I can even start with sharing knowledge. Building relationships is very, very important. And finding out if you can trust someone is a long uh, process. And the next step then is to find and address those who are, might be interested in learning about Bitcoin. Because local Bitcoiners in these areas are not very easy to find, but needed to build sustainable structures on the ground. So if I don't find at least one person who I can trust on the ground, then it doesn't really make sense to give a talk or do a workshop because I think it's important that people have someone there where they can go to, where they can ask questions. And that's why I'm so happy that we now have Bitcoin for Fairness Zambia, an independent initiative, and they are doing monthly meetups where people can come and ask questions. And on WhatsApp, I think the group has now grown to 100 people already. Another thing which is very time consuming is meeting and getting acquainted with the people around, with the area, with the local customs. Organizing an event itself, finding a place is not that easy. For instance, in Zimbabwe, I need to make sure that it's a safe environment where I can talk about Bitcoin with people because authorities are here and they are cracking down on people who are outspoken about their use of cryptocurrency on the internet. In Zambia, everything is a little bit easier because Bitcoin is more regulated there, which in that sense is a good thing um, as there are KYC exchanges and people feel safe to use cryptocurrencies that way. Although I always tell people not to use KYC exchanges, this seems like a contradiction, but it ain't actually, because what I want to say is using cryptocurrencies in Zambia feels more secure because the government is not publicly saying you're not allowed to use it or you shouldn't use it. In Zimbabwe, the last uh, thing I have learned or know is um, that they like or embrace blockchain, but the government doesn't want to have Bitcoin around. So there are no um, exchanges in Zimbabwe, nothing. You need to find a money trader. And there are a lot of them because people needed to exchange Zimbabwe dollar to US, US dollars anyways. And the same people are also able to exchange Bitcoin for you. And this is true, I think, for many African countries. It's hard to find reliable, trusted exchanges, but there are money changers, people who will exchange your Bitcoin to local currency and the other way around. In Zimbabwe, for instance, of course, another obstacle are the international sanctions, which cut the population off from exchanges and from many other avenues, like international payments. Or nobody, for instance, is using credit cards in Zimbabwe. So it's difficult to obtain Bitcoin there. Sometimes the local money exchangers can ask for up to 20% of fee for their service because there is not enough competition yet. So whenever I get the chance, I tell people to try to receive Bitcoin from their families abroad so that they send it to them and then they can exchange it to local currency on the ground. Besides the educational part, which I'm doing either through talks or workshops or doing interviews, radio interviews, podcast interviews, a high amount of time actually is uh, going into dealing with electricity problems, obtaining drinking water as the borehole in the house I lived in in Harare wasn't safe, so you couldn't, you couldn't drink it, and very unstable and slow 
exp slow and expensive internet connections, which is actually a big problem in Zimbabwe too. Now there is Starlink, but uh, I think it's still too expensive for the majority of the people, but it's an opportunity to receive internet and send or use internet. In Zimbabwe and South Africa, because I was speaking up about electricity problems, the thing is that depending on the area you live in, you sometimes have daily load shedding. Load shedding is when the electricity is being turned off for households when it's needed for the industry. So the industry has priority. The last time when I was in Harare in 2023, we didn't have any electricity between early morning and evening, sometimes late evening. And there is no information about that. So you never know when the power goes and when it will come back. In South Africa, it's similar, but at least people there get information via text. So the authorities tell people, okay, Today and tomorrow, the power will go off at 2 p.m. and it will come back at 4 p.m. And then we'll turn it off at 3 p.m. in the night again until uh, 6 a.m., 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. In these times, you need to organize everything where you need electricity for, like laundry, like cooking, like accessing the internet and recharging your devices. I was living in a house with a solar panels, so at least we had power during the day, but you always have to save electricity because the panels or the batteries we had were not big enough to store all the electricity we would have needed for 24 hours. So for instance, when we uh, want to do our laundry, we, it's always like a, a game, you know, like um, will the power stay on or not? Because our batteries are not strong enough so that we can use the washing machine. So there's a lot of organizational things going on in dealing with your life in Zimbabwe, which takes a lot of time from the time that you actually want to work or need to work or maybe have some spare time and rest. I had to stop releasing podcast episodes for my podcast show because of the electricity problems and the weak internet. Also thinking about, I mean, I realized how disempowering a weak internet connection is because you basically can't be a part of new developments online. You can't podcast, be a podcaster yourself if you don't have the money or you don't live in a urban area that you can afford a high internet connection, a, a very well functioning internet connection. And that's actually a big disadvantage for people in the global south in the global marketplace in the global digital marketplace. So yeah, that's uh, basically a lot of the things I'm doing when I'm in Zimbabwe or Zambia. I'm looking forward to going back there again. Hello, my name is Anita Posh. And if you liked that video, please subscribe to my channel now to inspire me to create more content like this. And if you want to learn more about Bitcoin, then sign up for my free weekly Bitcoin newsletter at anita.link news.